Welcome to session 10 of UGBS 301. And today we would like to take an introduction to hypothesis testing. At the end of this course, you should be able to learn how to formulate the null and alternate hypothesis for application involving a single population mean or proportion. You would also learn how to formulate a decision rule for testing the hypothesis. We learn how to use the test statistic critical value and then the p-value approaches in testing the null and alternate hypothesis. We would also know what type 1 and type 2 errors are, and then we would compute the probability of a type 2 error. So then, what is a hypothesis? Now, a hypothesis is just a claim or an assumption about a certain population parameter. For example, that if your friend make a claim such as that the main monthly cell phone bill of this city is $42. Or the person make a claim such as the population of adults in the city with cell phones is 68%. The proportion of adults in this city with cell phones is 68%. Then this is a claim that your, pers the, your friend has made and needs to be tested. Therefore, we need to know what the null hypothesis is and then what the alternate hypothesis is. The null hypothesis is a statement concerning the population parameter that needs to be tested, and this is assumed to be true during the conduct of the hypothesis test. The null hypothesis, in other words, is what is basically upheld until there is an evidence against it. It is either rejected or accepted based on a sample data. In formulating the null hypothesis, for example, we could say that the average number of TV sets, if the average number of TV sets in a typical Ghanaian home is at least three, then it is being formulated as H0 is such that mu is greater or equal to three. Mu is greater or equal to three. Every time our hypothesis is based on the population parameter and not the sample statistic. The null hypothesis is actually the one that states the assumption to be tested, and it's always about the population parameter, as I said. It always has certain strings of equality. So for instance, mathematically, the null hypothesis would always contain equal to, greater than, less than or equal to, or the greater than or equal to sign. It is always the situation that is upheld until we have evidence against it, and therefore, it always refers to the status quo. Also, the null hypothesis may or may not be rejected. The alternate hypothesis, on the other hand, is just the opposite of the null hypothesis. For example, if in the previous session we noted that the average number of TV sets in a typical Ghanaian home is at least three, and we formulated the null hypothesis as H0 is such that mu is greater than or equal to three, then the alternate hypothesis will be formulated as HA is such that mu is less than three. Therefore, the alternate hypothesis is what challenges the status quo and never contains any strings of inequality. For example, the alternate hypothesis will not have the equal to sign, neither will it have the less than or equal to sign, nor the greater than or equal to sign. The alternate hypothesis would always have something like the greater than sign or the strictly less than sign. The alternate hypothesis also may or may not be accepted and it is generally the hypothesis that is believed or needs to be supported by the researcher. Let's see an example in formulating hypothesis. The parking division of a rice factory will want to know if bags of rice are filled according to the five kilogram target or significantly below or above the five kilogram target. Now, since we believe that if the machine is working right, then it should fill equally five kilograms. We believe that the status quo is that the average fill rate should always be equal to five kilograms. And therefore, the null hypothesis will be that 
H0 is such that mu is equal to 5 kilograms, which is actually the status quo. Then the alternate hypothesis would be such that mu is not equal to 5 kilograms, which states which is a statement that challenges the status quo. Another example is this. Consider that the average waiting time at Ecobank Legon branch on a Monday to Wednesday is approximately 15 minutes, and management would like to maintain or improve upon it. Therefore, occasionally, management randomly pick customers and track the time spent between when they enter the bank and when they are served. The status quo here is that the average waiting time is less than or equal to 15 minutes. That is stated in the statement here that average waiting time is approximately 15 minutes. Therefore, the hypothesis to be tested is that the status quo, which is the null hypothesis, will be mu less than or equal to 15 minutes. Then the alternate hypothesis will be mu greater than 15 minutes. Note that only if the sample mean waiting time is substantially greater than 15 minutes will Ecoban management reject the null hypothesis and will therefore conclude or consider why they should probably increase the number of staff. Now there are different errors or several errors in making these decisions. Let's note that these decisions are made based on a sample, and therefore, different samples will yield different values. So, we believe that the results based on samples could technically give results that is quite different from the one we have in the population. For example, we can note that the null hypothesis about the population can be true, but not, but due to using results from a sample, it could be rejected. There could also be a situation that the alternative hypothesis can also be true, but can be rejected. So there are two situations here. We can either reject a true null hypothesis, or we can also accept a false null hypothesis. In such cases, we therefore say, that the researcher has made an error. There are two types of errors that will be considered here. The first type of error is a type one error, which is the error that results as a result of rejecting a true null hypothesis. This is considered as the most serious of the two errors. And we always tend to reduce the chances of committing these errors in our hypothesis testing. The probability of committing this type one error is given as alpha, which is mostly called the level of significance of the test. This is set by the researcher in advance. So, for example, if a researcher sets an alpha level of say 0.05, then it tells us that the researcher's maximum probability of committing this type one error is actually 5% or a chance of 0.05. On the other hand, the type two error is a kind of error that arises when one fails to reject a false null hypothesis. And this probability of a type two error is given as beta. So there are four kinds of decisions that can be made or four outcomes that can result in our hypothesis testing. We can commit an error or we can commit an error by rejecting a null hypothesis which is actually true, that is a type one error, or we would not reject a null hypothesis which is also false. That is the type two error. We can also make a very correct decision by rejecting a false null hypothesis or by failing to reject a true null hypothesis. So there are four outcomes of which true, two of them represent correct decisions and then the other two represent wrong decisions. 
The level of significance, therefore, is the probability, as we said earlier on, of making a type 1 error, that is, when the null hypothesis is true. And this alpha defines what we call the rejection region of the sampling distribution you see as you make, we go, as you go ahead in other examples. And it's designated by alpha. There are other values or there are other common values that we use to depict the level of significance. And these are alpha equal to 0 0.01, alpha equals to 0 0.05, or alpha equals to 0 0.10. And as we indicated earlier on, these alpha values are selected by the researcher at the beginning of the test. In hypothesis tests, we normally use a single population mean, in this case, X bar, to test the, the hypothesis under consideration. For example, if we have the hypothesis that mu is less than or equal to 25 days, and then the alternate hypothesis that mu is greater than 25 days, where mu is our population mean, then certain values of X bar will support our null hypothesis, while others would also tend to support the alternate hypothesis. Therefore, based on the normal distribution, we select a certain level of significance, say alpha, which gives us what we call a critical value. Now, this critical value will tell us at what point we would reject our null hypothesis and at what point we would fail to reject our null hypothesis. So, in terms of the alpha or in terms of the test and then the hypothesis formulation, these are several ways that we can put our normal distribution curve. For example, if our null hypothesis is such that the population mean mu is greater than or equal to three, or is greater than or equal to a certain value, this is what we call a lower tail test. It is a lower tail test because our alternate hypothesis states that the population mean is less than a hypothesized value. So you see that the rejection region or the shaded region is to the left on the normal distribution curve. For the upper tail test, it's the situation where our alternate hypothesis is actually greater or the population parameter is greater than the hypothesized value. And on the normal curve, it is shown to the right of the normal distribution curve. In terms of the two-tailed test, it's mainly used when our null hypothesis or our alternate hypothesis states that the population mean is not equal to the hypothesized value. In this case, we are not sure whether it is greater than the value or it is less than the value. All that we know is that the population mean or the population parameter is not equal to the hypothesized value. Given this, we are going to divide the level of alpha into two parts, where one part will be to the left of the normal distribution curve and the other part will be to the right of the normal distribution curve. And in all three situations, the shaded portions actually represent the rejection regions. We calculate what we call the critical value. In this approach to hypothesis testing, we convert the sample statistic, for example, the X bar, into what we call the test statistic, in this case, which is a Z or a T statistic. And we therefore determine the critical values for a specified level of significance from either a table or from a computer-generated output. If the test statistic falls within the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis. If it doesn't, we will not reject the null hypothesis. So, for a lower tilt test, we are going to calculate a certain critical value, which is a cutoff value that is negative Z alpha. And this value is negative because you are considering a lower tilt test where the alternate hypothesis is actually less than. 
So you see that this cutoff value, that is negative z alpha, lies to the left of our normal distribution curve. And in this situation, we are going to reject our null hypothesis if the z value we calculate is actually less than or equal to the z negative z alpha, which is the critical value. In terms of the upper tail test, z alpha or the critical value lies to the right of your curve and therefore also used for situations where our alternate hypothesis is a greater than and we are going to reject our null hypothesis if z is actually greater than or equal to z alpha. For a two-tailed test, we are going to divide the value of alpha into two. Therefore, to the left of the normal curve, we are going to have negative z alpha over two. Then to the right of the normal curve, we are going to have positive z alpha over two. We are going to reject the null hypothesis if the z we calculate for is greater or equal to z alpha over 2, that is falling to the right of z alpha over 2, or the z we calculate for is actually less or equal to negative z alpha over 2, which actually falls to the left of negative z alpha over 2. We continue once again with the critical value approach, and we note that in testing for hypothesis of a population mean, we also have, as we saw in the confidence interval situation, situations where our population standard deviation is known or situations where our population standard deviation is unknown. And under population standard deviation being unknown, we can have large samples or we can have smaller samples. We are going to consider all of these. In a situation where the population standard deviation is known, our test statistic z is actually a z statistic which is calculated as x minus mu or x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. Remember that as long as this standard deviation is known for the population, it is irrespective as to whether the sample size is large or the sample size is small. If the sample sizes are also large for the population standard deviation being unknown, we are still going to approximate the distribution into a z, which is also going to give you x bar minus mu all over sigma divided by the square root of n. Because our sigma is unknown, we are just going to replace our unknown standard deviation with the sample standard deviation. For the situation where the sigma or the population standard deviation is unknown and sample sizes are small, we are going to use the t-distribution that comes with an n minus 1 degrees of freedom where n is your sample size and is given as x bar minus mu divided by your standard deviation, which is for the sample, divided by the square root of the sample size. Remember that the population must be approximately normal. These are some of the steps in computing or formulating and testing a hypothesis. First, we need to specify the population value of interest. Then we formulate the null and alternate hypothesis. We specify our desired level of significance where the common ones are the 1%, 5%, or the 10% level of significance, we determine our rejection region, obtain the evidence by computing the test statistic, and then we reach a decision and then interpret our results, thereby concluding the situation. Let's take an example. We ought to test the claim that the true mean number of TV sets in Ghanaian homes is at least three. The true mean number of TV sets in a Ghanaian home is at least three. Assume that we know the population standard deviation and it's given as 0 0.8, and that out of a sample of size 100 is taken, and a sample mean is 2.84, we want to test the claim that the true mean 
number of TV sets in the Ghanaian homes is at least three. First, as we go through the steps, the first step says we should specify the population value of interest and it's just the mean of the number of TVs in Ghanaian homes. Our null hypothesis is stated such that our mu or our H naught is that mu is greater than or equal to 3. And then our alternate hypothesis is that our mu is less than 3. In the third step, we note that this is also a lower-tailed test. In the third test, we specify the desired level of significance, which states that our alpha is 0 0.05. That is, we are working on the 5% level of significance. Therefore, in determining the rejection region, the rejection region is going to be to the left of our normal curve, which is negative z alpha. From the statistical tables or from the z table, z, the value of z at alpha equals 0 0.05 is giving us negative 1.645. 1.645. But because this is a left tail test, we negate the value. So since sigma is unknown, the cutoff value is a z value. And that is why we are reading from the z table. Note that based on this curve, we are going to reject the h naught if the z that we calculate for our test statistic is less than the z alpha that we've tabulated, which is negative 1.645. Otherwise, we do not reject the null hypothesis. That fifth step says that we should obtain sample evidence and compute the test statistic. So in computing the test statistic, we know that we have a sample size of 100, a sample mean of 2.84, and then a sample, a population standard deviation of 0.8 where we assume that it was known. And therefore, our test statistic is 2.84 minus 3 divided by 0 0.8 over the square root of 100, and that gives us negative 2.0. We therefore, we are here to try and compare what we calculated for and then the value we had by reading from the statistical table. In reaching a decision, we do this comparison, and we realize that negative 2.0 is actually less than negative 1.645, and therefore, we are going to fall inside the rejection region, and hence, we are going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the mean number of TVs in Ghanaian homes is at least 3. The mean number of TV sets in Ghanaian homes is at least 3. Remember that the conclusion is made in line with the statements that was given in the question. There's also another approach to hypothesis testing, which we call the p-value approach. In the p-value approach, we convert the, the sample statistic, for example, the mean, to a test statistic, let's say a z or t statistic. And we are going to obtain the p-value from a table or from a computer, and we compare the p-value with a level of significance alpha. If the p-value is greater than alpha, you are going to reject the null hypothesis. Sorry, if the p-value is less than alpha, you are going to reject the null hypothesis. And if it is greater or equal to alpha, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is actually defined as the probability of obtaining a test statistic which is more extreme, that is, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to than, or equal to the, no, the observed sample statistic, given that our h naught is true. Any smallest value of alpha for which our null hypothesis can be rejected. Let's look at another example using the p-value approach. How likely is it to see a sample mean of 2.84 or something further below the mean if the true mean is mu equal to 3.0? Therefore, 
when you calculate at an alpha of 0 0.05, you realize that the probability that our x bar is less than 2.84, given that our population mean is 3.0, is actually giving us 0 0.22, 0 0.0228. When you compare this to the level of significance of 0 0.05, you see that this p-value is actually less than 0 0.05 and this will lead us to reject our null hypothesis. So we have a summary here that if p-value is less than alpha, reject h naught. If p-value is greater or equal to alpha, do not reject h naught. And hence, since our p-value is actually less than our alpha of 0.05, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Let's take an example where we have an upper-tailed test. A phone industry manager thinks that overall, thinks that customer monthly cell phone bill have increased and now average over $52 per month. The company wishes to test this claim and we are assuming that our population standard deviation is known and is 10 and that a sample of size 64 is taken and the sample mean is calculated to be 53.1. From the claim, you see that the industry manager claims that or thinks that the cell phone bill has increased. And therefore, our alternate hypothesis is a claim which is saying that the average cell phone bill has increased, that is, is greater than $52 then our null hypothesis will state that our average cell phone bill is also less than or equal to $52. We therefore continue to find the rejection region for this test. That is the second or the third step for the hypothesis testing situation. In finding the rejection region, we realize that alpha is given as 0 0.1 that is chosen by the researcher and the z value that corresponds to this alpha equals 0 0.1 is actually 1.28. We are going to take the positive 1.28 because we are considering an upper tailed test. Therefore, we are going to reject our null hypothesis if the z value we calculate for is greater than 1.28. In obtaining the test statistic, we note that our sample mean is 53.1, our sample size is 64, and our sample standard deviation is 10. And therefore, our test statistic, which is giving us S bar minus mu, divided by the standard deviation divided by root n, will give us 53.1 minus 52 over 10 over the square root of 64. That gives us 0 0.88. By way of comparison, we note that we are not going to reject the H naught since our 0 0.88 is actually less than the 1.28. Thus, the test statistic that we found doesn't lie in the rejection regime, but rather in the unshaded portion, which is the acceptance regime. Therefore, we conclude that there is not sufficient evidence to show that our mean bill is over $52. In terms of the p-value, we're going to find the probability that our x bar is actually greater or equal to 53.1, given that our mu is 52. And once we do those calculations, we find out that our probability is 1.0.1894, which is way greater than the level of significance. This tells us that we do not need to reject the null hypothesis. From the classical approach, which is the critical value approach, and the p-value approach, we've noted that we don't need to reject the, the null hypothesis. We now take an example that involves a two-tailed test, where a sigma is also unknown. The average cost of a hotel room in New York is said to be 168 per night. And out of a random sample of 25 hotels, we record a mean cost of 172.5.
and the sample standard deviation of 15.4, and we want to test at the 5% significant level if the average cost of the hotel is actually equal to $168 or not. Based on what we have, we have our null hypothesis being that our mu is equal to 168, and then our mu is not equal to 168 for the alternate hypothesis. Given that we are going to have a two-tailed test where we are going to divide the value of alpha into two, one being a negative portion and the other being a positive portion. Now, because our sample sizes are actually small, that is smaller than 30, and then our population standard deviations are unknown, we're going to employ the T distribution. Therefore, we are going to have a T at an alpha of 0 0.025, then a degree of freedom of n minus 1, which gives us 25 minus 1, giving us 24. Based on the test statistic, we have 1.46, that is the calculated test statistic, within which we would use to compare with the tabulated test statistic or the critical values. Given this, we find out that our 1.46, which is our test statistic, lies within the acceptance region. In other words, our 1.46 is neither smaller than negative T alpha, neither is it bigger than positive T alpha, but lies in the middle of negative, in somewhere in between negative T alpha and then positive T alpha. And hence, we decide to fail to reject our H naught and conclude that there's, there's no sufficient evidence that the true mean cost is different from $168. In terms of proportions, as we did for that of confidence interval, we also can formulate hypotheses for proportions. And in terms of proportion, we are saying that the sample proportion in the success category is actually denoted by x bar, which is the sample mean, divided by n, which is the sample size. Given this relation, our mean is given as p bar, that is s bar over n, and our standard deviation is given as p bar, 1 minus p bar divided by n. The sample distribution of p is set to a normal distribution, and therefore we are going to have a test statistic value of z equals to p bar minus p over p bar 1 minus p bar divided by n. And these things will hold when np is actually greater than or equal to 5. And then our n, 1 minus p, is actually also greater than 5. Let's take an example for a z-test for proportion. A marketing company claims that it receives 8% responses from its mailing. And to test this claim, a random sample of 500 were surveyed with 25 responses. We wish to test at alpha equals 0 0.05 significant level. First thing we need to do is to check whether our NP actually exceeds 5. And as we can see, our NP is 40, our N1 minus P is also 460, which tells us that these things exceed 5. And for the Z test for the proportion, we note that our P is equal to 0 0.08. Then our P is not equal to 0 0.08 for the hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis. Because we are using the z-test, we have a large sample size, and therefore we are using the z-test. And because we are using the z-test, we, we are going to have z equals to p bar minus p over p into 1 minus p, all divided by n, which is our sample size. So we have our p bar, which is 0 0.5, minus our p, which is 0 0.8, then divided by our p, which is 0 0.08, 
times 1 minus our p, which is also 0 0.08, divided by 500. And that gives us 2.47. That's negative 2.47. To reach a decision, we are going to reject our null hypothesis at this value of alpha. And once we've rejected the null hypothesis, we conclude that there is sufficient evidence to reject the company's claim of 8% response rate. For the p-value solution, we calculate and we get a p-value of 0 0.0136, which actually corroborates our conclusion of noting that the companies of rejecting the company's claim of 8% response rate. Therefore, in this session, what we've done is that we've addressed the hypothesis testing situation, and we've performed a z-test for the mean where our population standard deviation was known. We've discussed the p-value approach to hypothesis testing, and we've performed one and two-tailed tests. We've performed the t-test for the mean, also when the sigma is unknown, and we've also performed the z-test for the proportion. This are all done for a one sample situation. And therefore, in our next session, we shall treat hypothesis testing for means and proportions when there are two samples. Thank you. <laughs>